Welcome to Families for Life, a podcast of Oak Hill Baptist Church. On today's episode, we're doing Biblical Balance, Food. All right, folks, welcome back. We've got another great episode for you today. We're back from winter break. We took a few weeks off uh, over the winter break to celebrate the holidays, be with family. It was a great time. So this is the second episode back for the year. And this is another solo episode. Hope you enjoyed the last one and hope you enjoyed this one. I'm very excited about this one. This is something that I've thought about and been, been kind of thinking and praying about for some time now. And so I'm pretty excited about this one. Today we're talking about food. So I hope that, and we're going to see a biblical perspective. That's why I call it biblical balance of food. A lot of people think about food and we want to go to one extreme or the other when we talk about food, when we think about food. And so today we're going to see what does the Bible have to say about that? Remember to review, give us a review, like, subscribe, all the things. Uh, I want to let you know we are excited to be starting a new series coming up very soon, hopefully in the next week or two. And I've got a special guest that's going to come on and help me with this series. So I'm pretty excited about that. And so you won't just have to put up with hearing my voice by itself any longer. So we'll get right into it. Today we're talking about food. Why, you might ask? Well, I think food is amazing, right? I love food. Um, I have enjoyed all kinds of food. You know, it's it's amazing to me how diverse and different our food is all over the world. The things people create, the things that they eat, the choices that we have, the things we grow. And it's just amazing to me to see this from, from everywhere, from all over the world. Food is so versatile. It's so great. It, you can be so creative. It's also necessary. God created food as something that is necessary for living. We cannot go very long without food. And so we must have it. We must consume it. We must consume calories that our bodies will burn and use for energy to grow and change and to adapt to our environments. And food is just a necessity. But, you know, God, in the, in the same way God created the world with so much creativity, so much diversity, so much color. You think about the different types of birds. He didn't just create one bird or even 10 birds. There's hundreds of birds, different types of species of birds that have uh, been created, that have come out of that that process of adaptation as well. And the same thing with fish. And it's just, it's amazing how creative God is in his creation. And the same thing shows through with the food, all of the plants and animals and things that God has created that we consume. How we mirror God's creativity is what we do with those things. We can take a pile of simple ingredients and turn that into something amazing, something, you know, you put this ingredient with this ingredient and enhances the flavor and the taste. And it's just, it's great. It's great to see that. And we mirror Uh, God's creativity when we do that. And so as we look at food, food is also something that brings people together. Whether it's family, friends, business, many things happen around a meal. There's something special about a meal. People uh, eat together and oftentimes there's, there's a relationship being shared or a relationship being built on because of food. And so Most everything we do in life, if you think of an activity that is you have enjoyment in, there's some type of food with it normally. Even if you're, say, going on a hike, you might have a trail mix or you might have some kind of snacks that you take with you to give yourself energy along the way. Uh, you know, whenever we get together with friends and family, what are we doing? There's an element of food at holidays, at birthday parties. Every, there's food at almost every big thing and even little things that we enjoy in life. We want to sit down and watch a ball game. What do we do? Grab some food, grab some popcorn, grab a soda. We sit down. We want to enjoy that as we watch the ball game. So food is very important to us, very important 
to our lives, very important to our living. And so that's why I want to talk about food. Even though food is necessary, food is important, and overall food is good. Food is good. God created it and it's good. There is so much controversy surrounding food. You know, even recently I posted something on my Facebook by an author that I read uh, in the area of nutrition, Max Lugavera. And he's somebody I follow, and I've read his book, Genius Foods, and I would recommend that to anybody. But it's interesting that, um, you know, when you post something online, uh, you get comments about things. And I didn't think this was very controversial. I didn't hope it to be. I didn't want it to be. I try not to be very controversial. If you want to know my controversial thoughts or you want to do a, have a discussion, I like to do that face-to-face, uh, not just post stuff online. But anyway, I posted something, and uh, there were people that, that – this this post was encouraging people to make good choices for their health in, in 2023. So it sparked a minor debate, nothing crazy. Everybody was respectful. Everybody was great. And I love that everybody's so passionate about this subject because this is something that is important to people, and <clears throat> this was not one of those – online discussions where things get out of hand. Everybody, again, was very cordial with one another. But it did get me thinking, wow, look at how passionate people are about food. Look at look at how how we, we think about this. We have these choices. We want to advocate for them. And <clears throat> as I've read and studied, I've become more passionate about food. If you ask me about food and my food choices and what I think is good, I will share with you what I've what I've been researching, what I've read, and I will openly share that with you. <clears throat> but, you know, it, golly, there are so many opinions. There are so many things out there in this space. You go online and you say, what should I eat? What is good to eat? You will get a myriad of varied responses. Even nutrition, uh, nutritionist don't agree. People that study, people that research, people that look at the science, they don't agree on this. And it's just crazy to me <clears throat> that we we look at this and we think, wow, um, why can't we get some sort of consensus surrounding food? I think there's a lot of good reasons for that. But, you know, for the Christian, we have to ask the question when we're looking at anything in life, what does the Bible say about this issue? And especially when we're thinking about food, we got to say, what does the Bible say in the area of food? Does God care what we eat? Does scripture weigh in on the types of food or how much food or anything in the area of nutrition? And so I will say, as we dive into this, we can build a theology of food from scripture. We're not going to get a step-by-step nutrition guide from the Bible. That's not the purpose of it. And uh, but we can build some some great thinking, some theology for living from the Bible that revolves around our food. The first thing that we can discover is that God created us, created food for us to nurture us, to sustain us. This is the primary function of food. Every creature that God created eats in some form or another. During the seven-day period of creation, God created all the plants and the animals. And then in Genesis 1.29, he tells Adam, and God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with its seed is your fruit. You shall have them for food. So we see that God has ordained these the creatures, Adam, the creatures that he created, the living creatures, to eat food. Specifically in this verse, he says vegetation. And it might surprise you. I know it surprised me some time ago when I first looked at this and first kind of learned this, but the main theory supported by this scripture is that man and all animals were vegetarian before the fall. It seems like this is how God designed it before sin entered the world, that death was not a reality until after the fall. And so we see, though, very quickly after the fall, their first sacrifice being made by God himself to make clothes for Adam and Eve from skins, from slaughtered animals. And so from there, 
very quickly we see people begin to eat meat and we can safely assume that other animals did likewise. We know that Abel, the uh, son of Adam and Eve, raised livestock and sacrificed the firstborn of his flock to the Lord. And the Lord said this sacrifice was acceptable. It was pleasing to him. So we see that by this time, people ate all sorts of diverse uh, vegetables, plants, uh, they, they consumed meat, consumed livestock. They raised them for milk and for meat. And so this was just kind of the way things went. Very few stipulations on food at this point. We do see that there's another comment about food from Noah. And we see in, uh, well, from God, from the, from the Noahic covenant in Genesis 9. And it says in verse 1, And God blessed Noah... And his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So he's renewing his covenant with Noah, similar to the Adam and Eve covenant. And he says, I, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every living beast in the earth and upon the birds of the heavens and upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hands. They are delivered. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. As I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. You shall not eat flesh with the life. That is, it's blood. So the only stipulation here now is you can eat animals, plants, all of it is acceptable before the Lord, but you have to drain the blood out of the animals. That's the only stipulation God gives at this point. And so then we see from there, we when the Israelite community is beginning, you know, they're formed, the, the law is given to Moses. We see in Leviticus chapter 11, now we get a list of clean and unclean animals. So the Israelites were not to eat things like pork and shrimp, shellfish, insects, certain types of birds and fish. There's a whole list there that you can read. And God, re God deemed these things unclean. And so for a long time, the Jews obeyed, and they still obey these food laws, the, the, the kosher food laws, what, how they prepare things, how they handle things, what they can eat, what they can't eat. And many, many religions do this. Muslims don't eat pork. Hindus don't eat cows. They don't eat beef. And so different religions have different food laws. It is interesting to me that food seems so important to religion. And really, it's unclear as to why some of these foods are banned. There's a lot of theories, people saying that maybe... Uh, some of these foods could not be processed properly or could not be eaten in a way that would, um, you know, that people might get sick or, or the, the cleanliness at this time was not there. There's a lot of different theories about this. You know, I, I, the, the Bible just doesn't say specifically <clears throat> that this is why you're not to eat these foods. But I, I really think that this is probably a, a test of faith. God is putting this out there and, and saying, Will the Jews trust the Lord enough to follow his law? Will they trust him? Will they believe in him? And, uh, you know, I, I think that's that's part of the reason why these restrictions are there. But we know these restrictions are part of what is known as the ceremonial law. You know, we think of the law that's given in, in three parts, the ceremonial, the civil, and the moral laws. And <clears throat> Jesus largely did away with the ceremonial law. So for a long time, the Jews followed these restrictions and Jews today some of them still follow these restrictions but Jesus said in Mark chapter 7 and again this is verses 14 through 19 and he called the people to him again and said to them hear me all of you and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him but the things that come out of a person are what defile him and when he entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then you also without un then are you also without understanding? Do you see what whatever, whatever that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it entered enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Thus is a parenthesis here in the Bible, thus he declared all foods clean. So the point of this passage is Jesus is speaking about the holiness and what makes us holy, what makes us unclean, what defiles us. And he's saying there's no food that can enter the body that can defile us. What defiles us is what comes out of us, what, what we speak, what we think, what we do, the sin that is in our hearts. That is what defiles us. And from this, 
we understand Jesus, it says here, he's declaring all foods clean. It's not something that uh, that it's not something that goes into us that makes us unclean. Rather, it's generated, holiness is generated from the gospel in our hearts, the change, the inward change, and thus dealing with the sin that is the real problem that defiles us. And so Jesus himself tells us all foods are clean, are able to be eaten. And so Peter and Paul had their own experience with what was considered clean. You know, Paul uh, knew that he was going to go to the Gentiles. He knew that God had made a way through the gospel for them to be redeemed, not through the Jewish law. And there's a verse in 1 Timothy 4 where it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. Though the insincerities of liars whose consciousness are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from food that God created to be received with thanksgiving, by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing can be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. That's 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. So Paul, here we see Paul combating the false teaching. Some taught that marriage was forbidden. Others that certain food laws need to be observed. And what Paul is saying is that all of these things were created by God, whether it is food or marriage or anything we can think of that God created, it, it is good. It is good. And, um, you know, we see that that he's saying here, he's using food as an example, that some people were saying, if you abstain from food, you're, you're more holy. You're becoming, you, you're, you're, you're being more like God. You're following him closer and deeper. And that's just not true. Again, we know that being holy is a product of the gospel. It's the work, the the salvific work that God does in our heart. Again, not 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 the Bible says not by works, but it's grace through faith that we receive God's righteousness, that we receive holiness in our lives. And so Paul's making this correction once again. He's using food as an example. We're, we don't have to abstain <clears throat> from certain foods to make ourselves seem more holy or to be closer to God. Peter had a similar experience where he goes through a set of circumstances where he had an opportunity to minister to some Gentiles very early on. Uh, this is right after Paul is converted. And Peter really struggled with uh, this until God gave him this vision. And this is in Acts chapter 10. And it says, The next day, as they were on their journey approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop of the sixth hour to pray. And he became very hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And he saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descended, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. And in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice of him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the things were taken up to heaven. Now Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he might uh, that he might that he had seen might mean. Behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said, And behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So here we see God giving this, this vision to Peter. Peter has this opportunity to minister to these Gentiles. This was a new thing. Most of, most of the Christians, now we know that, of course, Pentecost, there were people from all over, but most of the Christians at this point, were Jews, and they were thought of as a sect of Judaism, as an offshoot of Judaism. But what God God had something so much bigger planned. Uh, this this new this new way. Well, not new for for him, but new for us of understanding religion, of understanding faith through the gospel. And so Peter is still slow to come around to this. And so God is giving him this vision, saying, "Hey, once again." What God has declared, what God has created is good. All of these things are good. There's no more ceremonial law. There's, this stuff does not make you holy. This stuff does not make you righteous. 
And so now he's using this as a way to say, Peter, you're to go minister to these Gentiles. These people need the gospel. These people can be my people. They can come into the faith through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is a lesson for Peter. Obviously, food is not the, it's used as an example. It's not the primary meaning of this passage, but it is used and it is helpful to understand. Once again, we have an example. God is saying these ceremonial laws, these food laws have been done away with. The new covenant has arrived. We no longer need to abstain from certain foods. So we see that there is a long history and track record through the Bible of food and what God allowed, what what was restricted. But, you know, as we dive deeper into really the issues with food, we come across the issue of gluttony. And we see that gluttony is the eating of excess food, and it, it's a sin. Gluttony is eating an obscene amount of food, making a habit of it. John Piper says, gluttony is the enjoyment of food that has become untethered, from contentment in God as the governing love of our life. So here's the thing. A lot of times we think of gluttony as eating a big meal, and yes, that is part of it. However, I will say that if you're going to a holiday or a sporting event or you're going to have a a feast meal or you're eating with friends or family, eating one big meal does not necessarily constitute gluttony. Okay, if you eat without any regard, you indulge excessively again and again, then you might be guilty of gluttony. But going to one Thanksgiving meal and piling up your plate and enjoying yourself with your friends and family and having a feast, that's not necessarily gluttony. You know, going through the, you know, going and eating a ton of fast food, going and and doing this on a regular basis, um, eating to where you're, you're just cramming yourself all the time that that is that is definitely gluttony and so we must realize that uh food is is super important to us it sustains us it binds us but just as like just like in in every area of our life we can overdo it we can we can take something good that god created and we can turn it into sin we can turn it into an idol we can turn it into something that we worship And so a lot of times gluttony is tied to the worship of food. And so if we are worshiping food, if it's taking the place where it is becoming the most important thing, the thing that fulfills us, the thing that sustains us, the thing that uh, with, where we have no, no regard to fulfillment in God, and it's just in food, then yes, gluttony is, is a problem for us. We have to realize that the spiritual and the physical are connected but the spiritual is more important than the physical. Jesus had some really interesting things to say about this. He talked about how spiritual food is more important than physical food. You think about in Matthew chapter 4 where Jesus is taught, he's out in the wilderness being tempted by Satan, and he says he's, he's very hungry. He's been fasting for 40 days, and Satan comes to him and says, hey, turn, you, you have all power turn these bread, turn these stones to bread so you can satisfy your hunger. And Jesus says, man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He also says in Matthew 6, 25, he says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. Is life, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He's talking about the priorities of, of the spiritual over the physical. And then finally in John 6, 27, he says, do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the son of man must give you for on him, God, the father has set his seal. We must keep food in its proper place. It can easily, easily become an idol in our life. If we let it just like anything else, but we must realize the spiritual is more important than the physical. This leads us to think about food in a sense of what it means to us personally. I think about food and, you know, there's a lot that deals with food and our conscience in the Bible. The one of the most helpful sections of this is in 1 Corinthians. Paul helps us put food in the proper perspective and helps us to understand the relationship between food and our conscience. You know, he talks about how the food that has been offered to idols in 1 Corinthians 8, and he says this, Food 
will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat it and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. He's saying that what we eat is an act can be an action of conscience. It can be a stumbling block for others. For instance, what would happen is there were these people that would sell the meat that was sacrificed to idols. Some Christians would think this was sacrilege if we eat that. Uh, many of the uh, more mature Christians thought, hey, this is not a big deal because these idols are not real, so it doesn't matter. We know the one true God we're worshiping. We can eat this meat and it doesn't bother us. But when Paul would gather with people of all different types of spiritual maturity, he didn't want to eat the meat sacrificed by idols because it might cause some to stumble. And so he is thinking carefully about these issues that are really not black and white. It's not to say that <clears throat> this is right or this is wrong. These are gray areas that we have to pray about and understand what our what we feel and what we believe in our conscience. And for us to, you know, look at this and claim our rights is not the right attitude. It's not the right thing to do in this situation. We must defer and look to others. So, I may have a <clears throat> belief in my conscience, but I can't put that on other people, nor should people put that on me. But I always must be considerate and thinking about my other brothers and sisters and how my choices and what I believe and think is going to uh, affect them. And so what we have to understand, Paul is more concerned with his brother's spiritual condition than what he has the right to eat or not eat. So Paul continues in this line of thinking. This is a great section to read, to go through 1 Corinthians and read 8, 9, 10, because at the end of 10, Paul says, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. What a great uh, verse there. And we have to ask ourselves, are we more concerned about food than the glory of God? We must always make sure that that there are not things that are ruling or reigning over us other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Food can be one of those things. Food can become an idol in our lives. You know, the reason that we have such a hard time with this is because many people have such a bad relationship with food. Our relationship with food is very dysfunctional. I'm speaking here primarily as an American and someone who lives in a land their food is for the most part plentiful. Even the, the poorest among us have access and resources to uh, food. For instance, we run a food pantry in our church that anyone can, can access, and we know others that in our community that do the same. Um, I know there's places all over this world where food is more scarce, and those areas you know need to be cultivated and helped, and, and the food does not need to be an issue anywhere in the world. God has made it plentiful, and we need to help make it plentiful all over the world. But in America, many people have a dysfunctional relationship with food. First, most people just don't even think about it. They just eat whatever is in front of them, whatever is convenient, whatever is easy, and we eat poorly. We trust people way too much. We... Uh, just don't think about it, and that's a problem. The other side of the extreme is that people think about it way too much. People obsess about what they eat. Uh, people count calories. They refuse to enjoy certain types of food. They Some people restrict certain types of food. I'm not going to eat carbs. I'm not going to eat fat. I'm not going to eat this. I'm not going to eat sugar. I'm not going to eat this or whatever. I'm not going to eat white foods. You know, we, we see all of these things that we try to restrict and cut. And listen, I've been an advocate of counting calories just because it helps you to get a perspective on the amount of food and what what the calorie count and the nutrition of food really is. I've learned a lot through that. And I don't count calories all the time, but if I'm in a place where I'm trying to cut back, drop a few pounds, yeah, I do do that. 
uh, but it's not something that we can get we can get too obsessed with it, and it can become a problem in our lives, like all of these other things, trying to restrict certain food groups. You know, once again, God has created all things as good, and we can enjoy all of these types of things. Now, others, <clears throat> out of conscience, uh, want to eat a specific diet, and this mainly happens with people that do not want to eat meat or animal products. You have people that are vegetarians or vegans. Now, really, I, I respect these people. Uh, I am not anti-vegan or anti-vegetarian. I myself eat meat and animal products, and I don't have a conscious or moral objection to it, but many people do. They're bound by their conscience. They have an issue. They don't want to kill animals. They don't want to use animal products. I don't agree with them, but I respect them. And I would not put them necessarily in the bad relationship category unless they are obsessive about it and they want to force others to live as they live. This is why this is a, a biblical balance is because God has given us the freedom to make these choices, to, to pray about this, to make sure that we have thoughtfully considered what we're consuming and putting in our lives. We don't need to go to one extreme or the other. We need to be based in grace. If, if somebody wants to be a vegan or if somebody wants to be eat meat, uh, great, I'm happy for you. We need to let everyone pray about it and make their own choices according to their own conscience. But in general, I would say most people have a, a bad relationship with food, and I've been guilty of this. I've used food as a source of comfort, as a, as a vice. I would use food to self-medicate. And over the last couple of years going on this health journey, I've been more mindful of of what I eat. I'm Listen, folks, <clears throat> there's still times that that I struggle and there's times that I'm still in process. I'm still arriving, still working on some of my health goals. I'm not there yet, but it has helped me to be more mindful and think about in these areas, in this area of food because of what I've read and how I've tried to live. And so I think it's really helpful to, to think about these and, and make sure that we have a good relationship. You know, over on John Piper's website, Desiring God, he's got a, an article about four signs that food has become an idol. And I think these are really helpful. Number one is we become indifferent to the harmful effects that food is having on the temple of the Holy Spirit, our body. God calls our bodies the temple of the Holy Spirit, something that we house the Spirit of God in, and we're to care for our bodies. We're to think about it in the sense of something that is honoring the Lord. And so if we become indifferent to our food, we don't think about it, we don't think how this is affecting us, it, we, we, have a, we have a bad relationship with food. Also, number two, we also become indifferent to the way we are stewarding our money as we spend unwisely on wrong foods. Listen, <clears throat> I've been there. I've wasted way too much money when I was younger on eating out on convenience foods. And once again, I, we, we go out to eat every so often, but there is a there is too much of eating out. There's too much of wasting money when there are better choices, healthier options out there. And so again, I'm not advocating against eating out. I'm not advocating against restaurants. I am I am saying that we need to make good choices and make sure that we spend our money wisely on good, nutritious food that's going to help us. So we also number three start using food as an escape from our problems and a medication for our sadness and our misery and our discomfort. I'm guilty of this. You know, if we are not finding our contentment, our joy in the Lord, we're looking to other things to self-medicate. And there are many things, many, many, many things that we use to medicate and to find contentment in besides the Lord. Those things are idols in our lives. We've got to call those out. We've got to find accountability. We've got to find help in that and make sure that we're not in this area, in this specific talk, using food to escape our problems or self-medicate. Number four, we stop enjoying food as a way of enjoying God. We stop tasting the goodness of God and the goodness of food. We start replacing the goodness of food with the goodness of I'm sorry, we start we start replacing the goodness of God with the goodness of food. This is gluttony. This is what we talked about earlier, where if food becomes an idol and we, you know, don't think about it in respect by how God has given us to fuel our body, God has given us as a way to enjoy company, to build relationships with our family, with our friends, 
uh, in business and all of these ways, if we start to, to detach all of that and it just becomes about eating, it just becomes about filling our bellies, we got a problem. You know, this is why we pray. This is why we thank God. You know, God is, you know, you go to the store, you buy the food and you, you bring it home, you cook it, you prepare it, or you go out to the restaurant, you buy the food. It's good to say a prayer before your meal because it gives you a pause to think, no, God is really the one providing this. God has made a way for me to feed myself. And because of that, I need to worship the Lord. Because of all of this great, tasty, amazing food that he has blessed us with, we get to enjoy this. We get It's, part, it's one of the greatest joys of life. And it's because of him. We got to keep that in the proper perspective. So those are four warning signs. I thought of what does it mean to create a good relationship with food? These are things from my personal experience that I think can really help us in this area. These are things that I've tried to put into practice and I think would be helpful for you as well if you're in this, if you need help in this area. Number one, you pray about your relationship to food. Yes. If you have a poor relationship with food, start with prayer. So many of us say we want to change, we want to do this, we want to do that, and we neglect to start on our knees. We neglect to start with prayer. I've shared openly that in my health journey that I began to pray and beg God to help me, and he did. And he gets all the glory for everything he's done and everything that he's doing. And so we've got to pray and ask God, help us to to get this in line, help us to make the right choices, to change what we uh, believe about food and understand about food and how we can do better. Number two, prioritize the spiritual over the physical. We talked about this. Jesus really emphasized this, that if we put the physical needs, the physical desires over the spiritual ones, we are missing out. We have to submit our food to the Lordship of Christ. We have to understand, hey, food has a purpose. It is good. God created it. What is its purpose and are we using it for that? Or has food become something that is controlling us? And if so, a great way to break this sort of control is to enter into a fast. Uh, This is a a, a fast is a a season where it could be a couple days. Uh, Some people go longer, but you need to do some research on this as well. There's lots of great things on Uh, desiring God and other places like that. But um, a fast is going to help take your focus off of food. So instead of eating a meal, you may do a breakfast fast or you may do an all day fast. Uh, You're going to spend that time that you would be eating, praying, reading scripture, meditating on the word, focusing on the Lord. And so what that is going to do is help you to realize we're not just sustained sustained by our food. We're sustained by the Lord. We need him more than anything. And so that fast will help take those priorities off of food and put them on the Lord. We also, number three, need to do our research. We need to read. We need to study. We need to think. And listen, don't trust what you hear all the time. You know, science is so funny because we we claim science as the be-all, end-all of truth. And it's funny because science is evolving. Science is changing. What people used to believe was something that was harmful for us is now good. And then it's harmful again. And then it's good. And so, you know, one, one of the things I, um, <clears throat> I try to, one of the myths I try to, uh, talk to people about is people say eggs, eggs are bad. Well, eggs were good forever. I mean, we're, we're talking, thousands of years eggs were good then all of a sudden because they have high cholesterol we think that there's a a correlation with the high cholesterol of people where well are we really looking at all of the food choices that we're making and we're singling out one thing there may not be a correlation to eating eggs and having high cholesterol there may be a correlation between eating processed uh fatty foods uh you know the ones that have the, the, the polysaturated fats, the ones that um, are fried, the ones that are, you know, the other things that we eat, very processed, that may be contributing to cholesterol more than eggs. That's just one example. I don't want to get off on a tangent here, but do your research. Remember, I, I like to think the old ways are oftentimes better. Things that we have known for a long time, foods that we have eaten for thousands of years, things that people have been consuming. There are pockets 
of this world where people have great health and long life and low disease. You know, one of the areas is in the Mediterranean. And so some people have said, we got to eat the Mediterranean diet. But then there's people in, uh, say, like in um, East Asia, in Japan, in that area, that are super healthy. And their diet is totally different than the Mediterranean diet. I don't think it's one diet that you have to fix your your mind on. But I do think that some of the things that they eat, some of the some of the uh, the focuses that they have, are really helpful to you know kind of kind of moderate our diets. One of the things that that they all have in common is many of them are are natural foods. They're they're whole foods. There's not a lot of processed foods that are, it's the things they grow out of the ground. It's the animals that they raise. And so that is one of the, 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 the commonalities, but listen, we've got to do our own research, read, study. Don't just let someone tell you, this is what you should eat. This is healthy for you. Uh, there are, you know, many, many different types of diets. Some people have to eat a certain kind of diet because of things going on in their body. And we have to respect that. We have to, they have to shape and change their diet because of that. So I think we all have to do our research. Then number four, we got to understand the more whole and natural, the better. Now, again, I'm not saying that we can't eat foods that are from the grocery store. You know, you don't have to go out and get a garden and grow all your foods, although that is a great option. But I think the more whole, the more natural. And I'm easing into this. I've not been into this very long, but I'm trying to eat more foods that I prepare, more fresh foods, more things that I'm doing rather than buying things that are cooked already or things that are convenience foods, things that are packaged. And this is something that you can do if you want to meal prep, if you want to prepare. You can buy, say, vegetables or meat in bulk and you can prepare them and save them for for other times when you want to, you know, for other meals throughout the week. And so I think the more whole, the more natural, the better. That's, well, again, that's, that's something I think that we need to move towards. Number five, don't use food as a reward. This is something that we often do. And I know that if you use food as a reward, it, w- it can backfire. You know, we got to understand that not everything in life, there are times we celebrate. There are times we, we need to eat the piece of cake because our, our kid is having a birthday party and we don't want to say, hey, all sugar is bad all the time. I, I'm not really into restricting certain types of food. Uh, I don't like that. I, I do try to eat less sugar and, and low sugar because I don't think that's super helpful to our diet, super healthy. It's like the same thing with fried foods. I try not to eat a lot of fried foods, uh, chips and French fries and things like that. Occasionally I do, but I try not to. But we can't use food as a reward. Every event, every thing that, you know, somebody brings donuts into the office, it's not a celebration. You know, if you live in an office with a bunch of people and there's birthdays all the time, you don't always have to eat cake. And I know the temptation is there, guys. I'm saying this as somebody who uh, has struggled with this for a long time. But that's, that's where we've got to break that bad relationship with food. And then number six, this goes along with number five, enjoy food, but don't worship it. God created food as a source of enjoyment. God created it that we can have food in uh, so many different ways and creative ways, and it's good, and it tastes good, and it's good to eat good food. Okay, I want you to understand that. It's good to eat good food. And I've had all kinds of feelings the last couple of years surrounding food. When I sit down to eat, and I'm thinking, oh man, I shouldn't be eating this feeling guilty about things. Folks, I think we need to um, not tie so much of our thoughts and so much of our actions to food. Keep them focused on the Lord. Enjoy the food that we have. Make sure that we, we eat well, that we fuel our bodies well, and we don't let food become a source of worship in our lives. We are in danger of, of being in gluttony and being in sin, uh, idolizing food. And so we want to make sure we enjoy it, but don't worship it. Folks, I hope this has been helpful to you. I just wanted to think biblically about food and what the Bible has to say about it and how this can kind of help mold and shape our own diets. It's so helpful to me to, to think about these biblical balance and to realize that many times we don't have to go to one extreme. We don't have to uh, obsess over food. 
but we and, and, and the other extreme of not thinking about it all. We need to put it in the proper perspective and understand how God created it, why he created it, and how it can help us. Well, I really appreciate you listening, and I will be back next week with another episode. We hope to start our series. Don't hold me to that, but that's my goal. And uh, you have a great day, and I'll see you next time.